Okay, um, so this is my own study uh, done with uh, Xinming and uh, Chen Wai Kuan, who was my uh, research assistant at City University of Hong Kong. I'm going to talk about a, an artifact that we call uh, special digital money uh, concerning a study in mainland China. Sorry, is there a way to, to expand them? Um, because I couldn't really read. Uh, I don't need to read that. Ah, okay, awesome. <laughs> I can read now. Um, so, um, yes. Speak louder. Okay. Sorry, I have a soft voice, so that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, so, when we think about digital money, like many different artifacts, there are formal uses and informal uses. So we got this term from, uh, like if you are looking at education research or learning research, there are formal education, informal education. So there's no formal context and informal context. So formal uses of digital monies are typically context or use cases de defined from the perspective of institutions. So for instance, there are of online uh, and offline retail context. So when, when institution or designers, representing institution are designing money, we often think of these cases as our uh, main uh, design context. So design of credit cards, uh, contactless smart cards, uh, and PISA to some extent, uh, virtual currency, or whatever pay, there are many kind of such payments emerging. We often think of merchant, and then there is a uh, customer who is paying, right? One is to one, straightforward. Try to make this uh, interaction as, uh, in terms, try to measure this interaction based on things like functionality, completeness, consistency, accuracy, so on and so forth. These are all institutional measurements. But these digital monies also involve informal uses that we often overlook. So these small transactions can happen anywhere and emerging out of users' perspective. So, so examples of informal context is you went for dinner with a group of friends and one of them paid. You want to pay back this person. Um, another example might be giving of ritual gifts. Like in Chinese culture, there is a red, red packet. And in Malay culture, there is a green uh, uh, packet of money. And in these informal uses of money, they're typically dominated by uh, good old cash. So, how can, we, how can we design digital monies to fit into uh, these kind of informal uh, situations? So it turns out the anthropologist, uh, Viviana uh, Zaliza, already discussed informal users of monies uh, in what she calls special monies. And, and we, we borrow a lot of conceptual ideas from her. And she said that while the economic model assumes that all monies are the same in the modern world, the special monies model assumes that there is a plurality of different kinds of money. And each special money is shaped by a particular set of cultural and social factors, and it's thus qualitatively distinct. So she pointed out many examples like um, domestic money, women's household money, and um, uh, husband allowances. So for example, in the past, maybe not true today, um, in the past, Men's allowances, you can get drunk, you can buy beer and have a good time with your friends. But women's money, you have to spend prudently. You have to think about how you want to divide the money across the week and, and you need to use that to buy ingredients for cooking and your child's uh, uh, expenses. So it is, the meanings are different, the ways they spend different kind of money are different. And this is what uh, Zeliza called special monies. Right, so how can we design digital monies to serve this type of informal context? So it happens that um, I was actually, I, I became interested in this research after I, uh, because I'm in Hong Kong, and a lot of people are telling me that uh, 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 Alipay and WeChat wallet are going crazy in China. The, such high adoption rate, and people are using them in 
context that we have never thought about. And this is, this is one of the motivation that we enter this research site. So we look at Alipay of 270 million users, WeChat wallet, 400 million users in China. Huge user population. So both apps are free to use for users. Merchants have to pay a small sum of 0.6%, that's still very low. And uh, people can deposit or withdraw money from their bank accounts, making it quite convenient for everybody to use this app. So we conducted 24 interviews with Alipay and WeChat wallet users in China. Typically, they, everybody uses both at the same time. So there's no, um, no strict competition, some, but they do have some overlap. And we started with five interviews in Hong Kong just to learn about, give us an idea of how people are using them. Once we have an idea, uh, we traveled to Beijing, where we conducted uh, three interviews and then snowball this sample to another 13 users. And to, to cover angles from uh, overseas, the use by overseas Chinese, we interviewed three more uh, Chinese who are living in California. So basically, if you have a bank account in China, it should be easy for you to set up uh, one of these two apps. So a lot of Chinese users are using them. Uh, 15 females, 9 males, uh, ranging between 20 to 33 years old. Uh, probably more than half are students, but there are 9 working adults. So it's very interesting, when, I, when we went to Chai, uh, Beijing and we, we, you know, we left the airport on the way to a hotel, we already started noticing uh, high dominance of um, uh, WeChat wallet and Alipay in the Chinese environment. So um, all taxi drivers, uh, food peddlers, restaurant owners are using them. So for instance, uh, when we enter the taxi, um, taxi driver has a, a QR code card that he will use to receive payment from customers. He can easily tuck it away in the taxi as well, so it's really convenient, it's not electronic, it is physical uh, QR code card. Then you can scan them uh, to make payment. And we call this form uh, mobile and placeless money. So in mobile and placeless money, the actors' monetary activities are on the move or for other reasons disconnected from retail infrastructure. So these contexts are where it's difficult to set up things like a point, point of sale system, where you don't have a telephone line, it's really hard to set these things up. And this QR code card made it very flexible for merchants uh, uh, to install this kind of, uh, or to accept digital payment. And there are also examples where sole proprietors, they receive payments in amounts too small or too frequently, especially food panelists. They, 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 they want to work really fast, uh, but amounts are very small. And it is really difficult for them to handle credit card because their, their hands are oily and, uh, and they probably don't want to handle cash as well if they, they, they can. So Yun Qin said, there are many food stores and peddlers in the campus selling uh, pancakes and street food, and they have supported Alipay. So now, for example, for one or two yuan, a very small amount of money, it is troublesome for them to receive your money or to return you any change. But Alipay is really convenient. So these are cases all over China, if you go to China, where all kinds of food sellers, they have QR code card. Um, it is an honor system. They don't check how much money uh, that went through their bank account, and you just, you just pay. Uh, because and they, they wouldn't have, have to dirty their hands handling cash as well. So it's, it really speed up transactions. And another form of uh, pay digital money is, uh, is what we call ceremonial money. So in China, a, a cultural artifacts called Hongbao is something that you give to your, uh, usually from a senior to a junior person, like parents to a child, or to a boss to employees, uh, and for ceremonial purposes, where you have something to celebrate, like the employees did really well, and you can give them a Hongbao uh, promotion. Uh, New Year, Chinese New Year, Hong Bao. Some, uh, somebody has a new, has a baby, you know. or somebody got married. Hong Bao. So this ceremonial uh, is widely used in China. So WeChat wallet digitized this Hong Bao in the um, IM, where the person can open it instantly. So uh, it's widely popular in China as well. So. Hongbao in China has changed because the society structure has changed. People move far away to work 
from uh, their original hometown. So it's really difficult to give Hongbao nowadays. So for this reason, digital Hongbao has become really popular among distant relatives. For instance, for instance Meiling said that uh, we always send Hongbao back home during festival. For example, during the last Chinese New Year, I sent a Hongbao to my niece, and we could not meet since we live in different cities. If we could meet face to face, I would rather give her traditional Hongbao instead. So it, it, create, it delivers um, cultural meaning, not as, not as good as face to face, but it's very popular because of structural change within China, within the uh, society of China. So another kind of use that we call play money um, can be found in WeChat. So play money is actually very straightforward. So for you, for anyone who use IM, you know what is an IM group, right? It's a group of people within a group. You send a message, you broadcast to every member within the group. So for Lucky Hongbao, you, you can initiate the game. You, you put a Hongbao in there with, say, 50 yuan, and everybody in the group can draw from that Hongbao, and he'll get a random amount of money back. The person who wins is the person who gets the most money, and this person would have to put another Hongbao back to keep the ball rolling. So there's, in the end, there's really no, not much win or lose. Um, it is a game that is really fun. And Xiao Yu said that we treated this as a game. Say, let's say somebody contributed Hong Pao and see who may draw the largest amount. Uh, divide the Hong Pao into 10 Pao. And whoever gets the largest amount contributed a Hong Pao and so on and so forth. It helps kill bottom and you can play with it together with colleagues. It's really easy to understand. And another participant said it's more like sharing snacks. So instead of you know, buying tidbits and share with the goodwill, play with money and it's fun so what is really interesting in these cases is like things like lucky money uh, reorganize money flow but it's not traditional uh, a customer to a merchant relationship you're putting in money under certain conditions of randomizing uh, uh, how much people can receive and, and indicating multiple recipients and that changes the meaning of money in that particular context. So another thing is dining money. Uh, for those who have lived in China or been there for a while and dining with Chinese people, there is this interesting thing about dining in China. Uh, among Chinese, dining is very important, it's very ritualized. And it is considered impolite for a group of diners to even think about splitting bills or gold dutch. And I always have to be very careful when I'm doing ethnographic research in China uh, for this reason. So, say Lin Kui said that sleeping bill hurts our relationship. So, if it becomes too much for someone to pay all the time, I will pay this time and you will pay next time and we will never split the bill in half. Sleeping bills is very weird in the Chinese culture. And Xiang Dong said that if someone fights to put the dining bill and we feel it is unfair to him because he kept paying, you see, it is paying sometimes is the responsibility. Oftentimes it's the responsibility of someone who is more senior. But but the person could keep paying all the time and it becomes really weird. So due to Alipay design, um, they could transfer the share of bill to him privately, not publicly, and he cannot reject the transaction. So it kind of resolves uh, the, the misfit and contradiction between the culture and how we should go about the social practices. So dining money halted the flow of money, basically, from the other direction, to, ma to manage the complex uh, dining practices in China. So we are introducing this concept as a new form of special money for digital artifacts because in a way, um, digital artifacts are much more uh, uh, malleable and uh, appropriable than cash money, originally examined by Zeliza. And, um, and they really serve a lot of different purposes that, we, that it's hard for designers to conceive outside of retail uh, environment. So there's ceremonial money, play money, running money, and so on and so forth. And what is really interesting to us is that these two apps provide a different kind of uh, uh, on-screen representation that allow users to choose the form of meaning they want to 
uh, that they're using the money for in particular uh, situations. So we are arguing that applications that support special money at use should provide sufficient flexibility so that users can select and customize the right money behavior in their particular context. So for a start, we provide some uh, recommendations that designers could look at different dimensions of money use in the context, for instance, actors. So we should not be constrained to just one is to one relationship. We should think about how many actors there are in, in a particular context. Uh, who are the recipients? Who are the pay, payers? Um, and so on and so forth. And context, is it online or offline space? And representation. Oftentimes, from an economic perspective, uh, monies are just numbers. They are data, information, right? But monies are not just numbers. For instance, the red, red packet situation. Money is the red packet symbolizes a ceremonial purpose that is important to a culture of people. And monies could be represented in other ways as well. And so we should be flexible in terms of thinking how money should be represented. And also quantity. So in a one-to-one -one relationship, quantity is fixed. It is what is given down in the bill. But in lucky money, the payment amount is not fixed. In fact, it is random. And also flow, one-to-one, uh, one-to-many, to many many-to-one, or many-to-many. Many. Um, for instance, in, the, uh, in another study that I'm working on, that I worked on, on Bitcoin, uh, there, is, there is a kind of um, uh, uh, context where uh, communities are actually uh, contributing uh, through cryptocurrency uh, to sponsor another community. So there is this uh, Bitcoin community uh, sponsoring activity on, for eSports community. So it's a community to community uh, uh, activity. Right, so there are many people paying into one account, then this account is sent to uh, esports community and they are using, uh, doing for different purposes. So for, for, for things like cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin, uh, developers can also customize the flow, which makes the use of money in this context really interesting. And then there is also timing, uh, like under what conditions will the transaction rules be activated and things like that. So as a general reflection, uh, we felt that there are many contexts uh, where companies are offering uh, mobile payment with a, using a very fixed set of formal use cases. So we are arguing that we should think of uh, giving merchants and users more flexibility and options. You know, digital medium, QR code medium, uh, different kind of medium that can fit better in certain situations. And um, so we question the need to rigidly couple payment platforms and media design. So in the sense that one of the strengths of these two apps is to provide many different media of payments. And by allowing users to appropriate the right medium, users then can become the agents which make digital money special. Thank you. talk um, thank you so much for sharing I had a question about how um, so in your last line you mentioned about how users can become agents thanks to how technology is flexible um, I was thinking particularly about recently recently I got this card called a Monzo card I don't know if you've heard of this new fintech where you it's a completely smartphone based card mm -hmm. so anytime you spend any money you get an instant notification on your phone saying you spent X amount of money and it's completely smartphone based. So actually it made me look forward to spending money. It made spending money cool and it's quite dangerous in a way. <laughs> um, but I was thinking about how, thinking about money as a social construct, how has it redefined how people in China, particularly the young, who would be predominantly the users of systems like this, how has it changed their view of money, of disposable income, and has it caused any generational shifts mm -hmm. in terms of viewing money, if you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Um, so this is what I heard. This was one of the questions we asked our participants in China. So when we were doing our study, uh, 2015, uh, so we went to Beijing. What they, what our participants told us was that um, 
in the early phase of the diffusion of this technology, uh, mostly, like you said, it was the young people who made use of this. Um, but if you are if you are in Beijing, you know the our participants could have a hundred yuan in the wallet, and still have the same hundred yuan at the end of the week, because you can use this thing everywhere. But they have to be very mindful when they are returning back home, let's say for Chinese New Year, they have to draw cash, lots of cash, because they're going to be paying for taxi and restaurants and other expenses. So there is a diffusion, and definitely the younger people are uh, the first to use that. So in terms of cultural change, I am not. From the many different activities we look at, like uh, the play money, uh, red packet, it's not so much of a cultural change, I think, but more like um, restructuring, reconfiguration of the assemblage of cash, and turn it digital uh, into many contexts. But so, but the same the same meanings about you know Chinese like to gamble. Uh, during Chinese New Year, and usually, you know, most people won't gamble with a lot of money. It's a social thing, and they translate these gambling activities into play money, and I think I think that is uh, a lot of the meanings remain the same, but it's just how can we can we how can we digitize them, and to uh, turn it into uh, use technology to support this kind of uh, traditional activities and reconfigure uh, the structure of these activities. Hi, uh, my name is Pankaj. I have a question. So, Rama Bijapur first spoke about the bottom of the pyramid, middle of the pyramid. If such a bottom of the pyramid exists in China, the middle of the pyramid, then there is certain affordances uh, to physical paper money. Mm. If users are migrating to digital monies, uh, are there any views, insights into how does you know how does it work? What are the issues over there? Yeah, I think I think you are right. Um, there are limitations if everybody is using only smartphones, um, which is why I think you have one point three billion people in China. I mean, the adoption of four hundred million users is phenomenal, but it is definitely only like thirty percent of the population. So uh, there are there are limitations. I mean, to the way which uh, you can digitize things, and you have to look at what kind of uh, uh, devices or technology that the population is really using. For instance, like things like QR code cards to receive payments. I think it helps a lot of small merchants in, in China to receive payment easily because you don't really need uh, the physical digital device with you at that time, but you definitely need someone at least to handle your, like your, your children, to, to handle your uh, your income at the end of the day uh, because uh, uh, eventually you have to go online to manage that payment and withdraw the money to your bank account and stuff like that. But there's definitely, definitely limitation, but I think in this case it really simplifies the situation a lot because now you don't need a point of view, point of sale system that costs a thousand dollars to install. Anybody who has a mobile phone could benefit from this type of transaction. I think it's a positive step forward, but a lot of things to think about for designers as well. Thank you for the great talk. I have a question regarding the red. Sorry, <laughs> sorry red pack packet. Um, red packet. Yes, yes. So because we have the same kind of culture in India, we share envelopes. Um, also envelopes. Yeah, we call it envelopes. But I was wondering whether there's a role of design in that red packet or it's the same design that is shared with everyone. Because in India, the type of packet defines the kind of type, the amount of money you are giving. So which design will mean it has a lot of money in, inside, so something like that. So I was wondering if that's the same case in China. Interesting. So I think in Chinese culture, I'm a Singaporean. Uh, so. The, the way we use, I can only speak from my own experience. So the way we use red packets, there's really no differentiation. We don't really, there's no uh, different grade of red packets. In, in fact, in Chinese New Year, sometimes we would put small amount of money in big packets. Looks great, but you know, we want to give someone we really love more money. We choose a small packet so it doesn't look too 
uh, it tends to stand out and, and make that person feel special. So it's more okay, like but actually has a lot of money. So that, yeah, we, we don't really have that, but that's really interesting when you have, you might need to think of different representation, to think of different grades, and these cultural meanings are fascinating because they vary so much across social groups. This is Abe Karnak from Lancaster University. Thank you for this talk. It was really, you know, captivating. Uh, I have two questions for you. First is, uh, how do you see taxation working for these kind of transactions? And obviously, the second part of the question is, is more about your methodology. And that is, uh, you mentioned 400 million users and uh, your sample size. Do you, how do you ensure that your sample size is captured practically everything that's going, all the interesting stuff that's going around with this kind of, you know, money. Mm. Okay. Um, first question about taxation, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not an economist. Uh, from my study, I realized that a lot of times when we approach from ethnomycological perspective or user experience, it has a lot of contradiction with regulation that existed for a long time and probably designed for human activities 30 or 40 years ago. Um, so that's really a tough question. I don't know. Everyone talks to economists about that. So the second one is the nature of qualitative study and in depth interviews. Um, it's true that the uh, sample size uh, uh, limitation and context is really important in our study. I do not think that we have covered all the different contexts. But from this small study, we identify like four to five different special meanings of money. And I think there's still a lot of room to to work on uh, uh, in this type of, uh, of study. Um, so it is not so much of, uh, the purpose of the study is not so much of covering all the different use cases, but to, to have to collect enough data to show that, hey, there's something we need to work on. And I think there's still a lot of room for other researchers to look at other kind of use cases. Thanks, Shibo. And thanks for, to all the presenters for the wonderful presentation and to the audience.